We are now streaming. All right, good evening, folks. Uh, tonight is uh, the business functions meeting for July. Um, we're really gonna be covering two topics. The first one is reviewing uh, something that we've been talking about for a little bit now, which is a refinancing of a uh, set or a series of bonds uh, that is gonna be coming up probably in August for refinancing, potentially later, but hopefully the sooner the better. And then we'll be discussing the potential addition of new monies in that refinance. Um, so at that point, I wanna turn it over to Anne. And Anne, I, I understand that you're gonna introduce Jamie, I, I take it at the beginning, and I'll just let you guys take it from here. Okay, uh, I'm gonna share my screen in a bit. Uh, Jamie provided us with a financing, financing analysis. And this is series A of 2020, which is a refinancing of the 2012A. So let me attempt to share my screen. Just so good at that. Joe, should I be able to? Um, you should be able to. You're set up as a uh, as a co-host, so. I'm just trying to find the PDF. Here we go. All right. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay. Great. Well, you can go to the next page. That's just my normal cover. So I will describe, obviously, this is a, a scan version. So as you guys know, when I first met with you, you know, a few months back, right when the quarantine started and the world started opening up, you know, we saw the market kind of shift and kind of move all over the place from an interest rate standpoint. Uh, initially, we saw rates jump up, you know, several hundred basis points. And it's tough to see on the right hand side if you're looking at the screen. But, you know, in that March, mid March range, rates, you know, went as high as they could go, mostly because there were no investors in the market, uh, they kind of disappeared to put their money under their mattress. Uh, you know, when stimulus package started occurring, we started seeing things open up. And that's really where we've been since. Uh, yeah, if you go to the scroll to the bottom and you can kind of see that little jump up there. So that mid-March spike was really kind of more of, a, more of a, a demand situation than anything else. But when things opened up a little bit from an investment side, people started taking their money and putting in other places and really looking for you know, safety. And that's really you know, dropped interest rates down for high credit individuals uh, like, you know, like the school district. Uh, so we've really seen a you know kind of a consistent drop, and really it's been pretty stable over the last month or so as far as you know as far as interest rates from you know a ten year and less payback, and that's that's where we sit with your debt. It's relatively short. It's always been relatively short, uh, just from the structuring standpoint. But you can see that kind of flat line since you know about the last month or so. You know again just a just a function of. Uh, you know, enough being out there and enough, you know, appetite for municipal debt. So we've been able to do plenty of refinancings and, and save people, you know, some significant money, just like we did with that, with the bank loan earlier this year. Uh, that market is still, is still good on the bank loan side. The bond market's, you know, is, is doing just as well. Uh, I, I mentioned, you know, a little earlier, um, uh, it's prior to this starting that when we did the bank loan RFP for, for that first refinancing, you know, we did it as a, that dual track process. And, you know, we were hoping that a, a major bank, JP Morgan, would come in and, and execute a, a strong transaction. And they did. Uh, you know, they, so they took on, you know, over $20 million worth of your debt. I, you know, I've had some conversations with the bank. I'm not sure if they're going to be in the ball game again, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so I think, you know, potentially, even though there's other banks out there, they were just so strong that I, I don't know if we'll be able to, to do another 20 plus million dollars, you know, in with the same kind of reflection in, in the market that we're seeing in, in the bond side. So from a timing standpoint, I, I'd probably, unless something dramatically changes, probably just plan on working toward a bond issue like, like we've done in the past and, you know, take advantage of the market in that sense. So that's kind of a high level thought. I don't know if we're going to see any major changes in rates, you know, over the next you know month or so. You know, I think my biggest concern in general is not really, you know, related to investments and things. It's just the potential risk related to 
you know, the world economy if there's another wave. I mean, that's that's really my bigger concern. Um, you know, if we unfortunately fall into you know the fall or whatever happen, you know, it's it's possible we 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 get that big spike again because the you know the investment world disappears. So not to you know put fear or anything in pressure. I like what I see. So my viewpoint is if we can get there, I think we, we take advantage of the all time lows at this point and you know, as quickly as possible. That's, that's a pure speculation, but it's, I think it's probably prudent to think that way at this point. It's, uh, it's really what drives, what's driving us is really demand in the market. And right now we have, we've got enough demand to, to be able to, to price bonds and, and get savings that are, are very, very strong. For the Anyone have any questions on this page? Uh, next page, I and mean, this is just a snapshot, you know, of you know what we're what we're trying to accomplish and what we've done in the past. Uh, just like everything else, um, you know, depending on what you guys plan on doing, whether it's just a refinancing of of existing debt, which is the 2012 A's, or if it's additional new money, I, I would do this in, in a using a parameters resolution where it essentially locks us into. The ability to kind of price bonds when the market makes most sense, uh, you know, establishing a maximum interest rate, a maximum maturity, uh, you know, those type of things. It doesn't reflect exactly what's going to happen, but it, it's for the purpose of, of getting us to DCD in a reasonable time, so we don't have to, you know, worry about coming back to a board meeting and only pricing on a day of a, a day of a board meeting. And I think in this world, the more flexibility you have, the better. So I know you've done it in the past, and that's my suggestion to do here. You know, the only question we would have, of course, that drives any of these decisions would be if you do add additional, you know, new money, you know, we'd obviously have to have that in this particular resolution as a purpose, one, and then two, need to determine the structuring uh, of, of the debt. And, you know, that's what we'll talk a little bit about in, in the next few slides from now. So anyone want to have any questions on this page? Uh, the next page, if you, I don't know if you can turn it sideways, you just turned your head sideways, um, you can at Sorry least- Sorry about that, I should have- No, you, you can have... right click and rotate clockwise. Thank you very much, Hunter. So, so uh, James- That's extra just, education uh, right there. Just a quick question. So you talked about purpose. So if we're gonna issue new money, there has to be a specific purpose tied to it. You you can keep the you can keep it generic enough that it's for you know renovations, acquiring property, you know whatever it may be. That could be generic enough, um, you know, from a from a useful life standpoint. And I think we're not going to have to worry about that given the terms of this. We'd obviously you know we can't be financing you know Chromebooks, you know something like that. But we we're talking about buildings like that. So from a purpose standpoint, we can keep it generic enough. Uh, and you know, as long as it's for general purpose, that that's good enough. Real Thank quick, you. Jamie, on that with the purpose, are there limitations on the time that the bonds can be used or need to begin being used? Yeah. So there, there's at the time of issuance, there's what is called reasonable expectations to spend the money within three years. There's arbitrage tests. Okay. So there's certain conditions that you try to fall under uh, and, under IRS rules. Uh, clearly, if you're looking at a you know project that's going to be 10 years from now where we obviously cannot finance it. Uh, most times if it's, you know, if it is a renovation project or, or some kind of addition and you, if you're at this point in time, you probably have reasonable expectations you're going to be spending the money within three years. It doesn't necessarily mean you fall within that, that window. You know, I have a client that, you know, that, that borrowed some money a year or so ago and uh, they thought they were going to meet the, the original tests at the time. And of course COVID happened and now they didn't meet their windows. So they just really have to, keep track of, you know, their, their spending timeline and ultimately mm -hmm. there's a, a need to go back to the IRS and let them know through their reporting, we would deal with that in the future. But in real life, you know, if you're borrowing at, you know, under 1% and, you know, if you're only earning, you know, 25 basis points, there's not really a big problem here. You know, it's really the problem where you're borrowing at 0.8% or 1% and you're investing at 5%, which is going to be pretty hard to do, but those are the times where the IRS really cares. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So again, just a snapshot of your debt. I know since this is the first time you've seen me technically since we did the refinancing uh, you know, earlier this year, you know, this is what your debt looks like today based on, uh, based on that refinancing. What you probably noticed before, and you'll see on, on, on a future page, we've been, you know, we've been structuring the savings a certain way 
really to kind of clean things up on your debt profile to kind of level things out. And that's really just was a function of the way your debt was structured and how reimbursement comes in and how you've taken savings over time. That's all good things, but we're really, we kind of want to make it as consistent as possible. So you're not seeing any major bumps in, in the road. And that's what you'll see in, in a few pages on, on the structuring here. It doesn't necessarily mean that's the final answer, but this is the way we've been thinking about it from a structuring standpoint. So you're not really worrying about, you know, five years from now, you're going to see some $300,000 bump or something like that. So you can see come 18, you know, shows you you're somewhere around the $770,000 range. And you're going to bumps up a little bit and you'll see, you know, where that hits us in the next couple of minutes. But most importantly, your debt officially drops off in, you know, in the 29 fiscal year. So, you know, that's, that's obviously a great place. We're going to be looking at, you know, any future debt. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, one, one avenue that we'll talk about. Uh, again, the debt we're talking about is column 12 or three and 12. It's the series A of 2012. You know, those bonds are callable on November 15th, which technically means we could settle as early as mid August, you know, given where we are sitting right now, we've you know, obviously taken some, some time to figure out what we may or may not do from a new money standpoint, you know, we're at the right time to do this. Uh, you know, the closer you get to the call date, you know, generally it, it's probably a good thing for saving money. Um, but anything kind of after that, you know, you start to lose that, lose that ability of saving. So again, we're, we're in a good place as long as the market prevails. And again, it's close to $20 million of outstanding debt. So on page four, really this is the nuts and bolts of, of what we're gonna try to accomplish and, and have a conversation tonight. Uh, the far, you know, the far, far left is, you know, is a holdover from the previous page on your existing debt and on how things fall right now. The, the, the first column or column one and column six, that was step one. That was the refinancing uh, that we did earlier. You know, again, we, we saved a significant amount of money, uh, $1.2 million over the course of time because of that tremendous bank loan that we received, which was, you know, just great. So we, we took the savings where we did and that started kind of cleaning up uh, some of your debt. Uh, going forward. So what, what is step two, uh, you know, step two or step two and a half, whatever we'll call it, going to look like? So that's the, the columns two, you know, and eight and nine. Uh, what we propose at this point is some conservative interest rates right now, knock on wood, uh, that you would save, you know, close to a million dollars over time that of all of cost of issuance. You know, again, looking at how we can structure your principal payback, you know, it's, there's, there's kind of a, you know, principal payback is mostly upfront. Uh, and it starts to drop off a little bit. So we can, we can take savings a certain way, but you can see here what we're trying to accomplish is you know, give you some savings in, in year 21, because you know, that's where we are today and you never know where the economy is gonna be in, in the future. So take some savings today and then kind of clean up some more of the you know, savings over the course of time that, that uh, you know, gets you to an even, even range. Uh, not perfect, but there's not much more we can do than that. You know, certainly if we generate more savings, we'll, we'll, we'll efficiently put it in, in places that make more sense. But again, pretty much a no-brainer to, to refinance it. Hopefully we'll save more than this, but, uh, but a good starting point. Questions? I figured not. <laughs> so step, the next step is, now let's talk about you know, additional borrowings. So there, there's gonna be two separate pages you know, that we'll talk about. So this is, this is alternative one, where we're borrowing you know, approximately two and a half million dollars, uh, give or take, for, for additional capital. Uh, this particular alternative, you know, as I talked about, you know, falls in, in a traditional, you know, what we call tight wrap structure where we're really not paying any principal back, you know, in, you know, for a number of years. And then we place the balance of the principal in, in the 2029 fiscal year. This is very commonplace when, when you know, school districts, you know, uh, borrow new money. Uh, you know, there's things that we'll have to think about, for, you know, from Ann's standpoint on, you know, the, the things that the state has to deal with, whether it's debt exceptions and exclusions and we're going to be doing some more digging in the future, at least from a, from a, this structure, it's provide the, at least the most efficiency of you know lack of interest expense because we're paying you know it back very very quickly and obviously there's you know quote unquote not a major impact for your debt you know going forward it's you know give or take you know actually your payments would be lower today than they were you know kind of the, the start of the fiscal year because of all the refinancings we've done and you're borrowing some additional new money. So that's, you know, that's the beautiful part about refinancings, of course. But that's, you know, that's the simple, simple wrap structure uh, for that option. Questions? And then just kind of flipping to the, the second page. Again, nothing, nothing crazy out of the ordinary. You know, again, savings look, you know, the same as they did in the previous page on, on that 
at Series A of 2020. So if you borrowed, you know, some additional money, about three and a half million dollars or so, it looked, you know, this structure would look exactly the same. We'd, we'd have the ability to, to place the balance of the principal in, in that one fiscal year. Uh, and there, you know, there'd still be some you know, wrap ability in the future as well. So again, the big difference is, is just the, the kicked up interest expense of borrowing, you know, an additional million dollars. So, you know, quote, you know, it's about what, $20,000 a year or more um, of, of additional interest, you know, interest expense over the course of time annually for, uh, for borrowing an extra million dollars. So, and obviously, you know, it's a great time in the market, you know, rates are extremely, extremely low. Um, you, know, you, you pay cost of issuance, you, you know, adding it all together makes a lot of sense. My viewpoint, of course, would be, if you do this, we would do this as two separate series of, of issues, just for purposes of reimbursement and things like that. But that's more of a, you know, of a rationale for us to how we structure the debt. But again, when the way you look at it is, you got the refinancing portion, you've got the you know, potential capital, and here's what it would look like from a, from a dollars and cents. That's and, it. Uh, you know, um, no, actually, I should apologize. There's one page, one more page. I apologize. The last page is what you've seen, you know, many times. It's a it's a preliminary timeline on you know how we can kind of get this done. Uh, and Ann and I and, and our, my group, you know, started putting together an official statement for the original bond issue. That was, of course, before your fiscal year ended. So we have a good start to preparing the document that would go to investors. We'd probably have Ann, you know, kind of update with, you know, unfortunately the year end just year just ended uh, with some kind of estimates if she has them. Uh, we would probably update that information and some other things, and we would be able to go out and you know start the process of getting a credit rating through standard and Poor's, and that's really what drives you know the timing here. You know they've been you know pretty active in the market and being able to turn things around. Uh, again, as I mentioned, you know, depending on the decision, you know, that the board makes with regard to any potential new money, you know, we would, would like to know that before we go through the rating process, because, you know, they certainly need to know what we're, what we're borrowing money for. So my viewpoint is you make a decision, you know, at your July or early August meeting, and then, you know, we'd have Peter Edelman uh, prepare the necessary documents and advertisements to come back at your board meeting on August 18th. But in the meantime, we'd kind of do, you know, the starting process to get us ready to go and, and get to market. So conceivably, you know, we could be locking in rates to this as, you know, as early as early September and, and, and pay off the debt and get it back by early October. That's, I think that's a pretty good, uh, you know, um, depending on decision making, of course, you know, that's, that's obviously what's going to drive. And is there anything that you want to add in here before I kind of process through this? Sorry, you asked if I wanted to add anything? Yeah. No, I, no, I do not. It's, okay. it's pretty straightforward. So I, I think uh, that we should definitely, um, you know, Dave and John and I are on the, the call from the committee. And I, I don't know if there's any other board members who want to speak, but I definitely think that we should proceed forward with the refinance as um, as we have listed and presented here. Uh, and that, that should definitely be our default option to be done by our August 18th meeting, consistent with the schedule that uh, Jamie and Ann have put together here for us. Um, I think the other piece here too, is to try and start discussing what type of new money there would be if any at all. Um, so I'll stop there and see if there's any concerns with moving forward with the refinance. Um, and then I think we can proceed to the second conversation about new money. Honor, I'm in favor. This is Dave, I'm in favor. I have no objections, I have no questions. I think I'm in favor. I'd just like to get a, get a sense of where Exeter would be in relation to other districts in Berks County and other other nearby counties in terms of a total debt as a percentage of some larger number. Uh, I'm still new enough. I don't know which. I don't even know what to compare it with. But wh where do we stand, say, among the 18 school districts in Berks County in debt per what whatever comparison factor you want to use? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll jump in. I, I'm not going to get you an exact answer. You know, off the top of my head, but I will tell you, you know, the credit rating process, you know, what is, what's determined when, when they go through the process. So number one, 
they look at many, many factors. I think that's the way I want to start thinking about it is it's debt, it's economy, it is, you know, uh, management. Those are kind of the major factors that we see that drive to your credit rating process, which is a double A. Uh, your debt is, I wouldn't say unique. I mean, there's a lot of school districts out there that have went through a, a, a major growth in the kind of the 80s and, and, and 90s. Uh, which is in fact you know, what Exeter uh, what Exeter did, and now they're coming closer to the next round of okay, are we going to start doing some you know, renovations and things like that? You fall in a great place where your debt is paid back very quickly. So the rating agency would compare multiple things. They'll say your debt to your assessed value ratios and per capita is one way to think about it. So you know paying back debt you know rather quickly you know does make your debt higher you know, annually, but because you're paying it back so fast, you get a plus on that as well. So it's kind of a delicate balancing act from how you need to think about things. You know, uh, the useful lives of things always matter, but school districts really do go through the RAP process in many cases because of Act 1. So I don't see anything you know, out of the ordinary. I would say that, you know, Wilson has a good amount of debt. I would say um, Mifflin had you know, had a decent amount of debt. They did a bunch of renovations over you know, this, around the same time you did. Uh, Muhlenberg is, I think, in the process of doing uh, you know some major projects right now. So there is a bit of a leapfrog. You're going to find out you know as areas grow and adjust with the demographics. So I would say, generally speaking, you fall within kind of a traditional school district, more than likely you know in, in Birch County, but really in Pennsylvania. Um, given the amount of growth you've had in the area over the last you know, 15, 20 years. So, so it gives you a great, pur great purpose, but you know, obviously you guys are the stewards of deciding of what your taxes need to be and, and where your debt is, needs to be. Uh, I, I don't think it's out of the ordinary. And if it would have been out of the ordinary, you probably see a lower credit rating. So that's, uh, that's the high, high wind answer of, of where I think sure. you're Okay. Where, where, do, where does our credit rating compare with or how does our credit rating compare with the other districts in Berks County? So you're you're one of the higher ones. You're you're in that range where, uh, and I, I won't do this off my head, but I, I'm pretty certain that Wilson and um, Mifflin are in the double A category, like you. I know that for a fact. They may be. I think this one was a double A minus, and uh, and Wilson is in the double A category, like you. You are double A. So those are you have S and P. Others have Moody's. Um, I would say that, and I think why missing's probably around the same range as, as you as well. Uh, there are other school districts that are, you know, kind of in the A category, but I don't think there's anyone higher in Berks County. I don't think there's anyone in the double A plus or double A one range. So I think you're, okay. you're up there. Okay. Thank you. And I can get you real, I can get you all the answers if you want. <laughs> That's just kind of using my, my, my head at this point. Sure. I understand. Thanks a lot, Jamie. So I think then we're good to move forward um, and pose that would, would we be posing this to the board as any type of action necessary at the July, what would that be? Uh, or August 4th, if, I, if I'm correct. The 21st, July 21st meeting, or are we completely waiting until the August 4th meeting? That's more. It depends on. <laughs> so I'm I'm okay either way. Okay. So are we saying that you would want to decide the the refinancing in concert with any new money? Okay. So then I would think that we'd want to have that ready for the August fourth meeting because I I predict there might be some discussion, but if that changes tonight, we'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. Until we really get to the you know the rating process, we have some time to figure. Okay. Out. Um, obviously, I think we've got a structure you know that we were, that makes some sense at least to, as a starting point, and we can do all the necessary things on our side to get kind of get my team and, and Ann to get things together. And then clearly, you know, when when we get to the parameters is when we need to have you know the necessary advertisements and sizings and everything else so that's that's really that august 4th meeting i think would be the deadline it might be point if you wanted to kind of proceed on this timeline yeah and i think we do i think we do um i think it's 
in our best interest, especially as we look towards having, uh, what is it, an excess of $3 million deficit this year, and to be able to make sure that we're securing you know, our resources for the future to make sure that our buildings aren't falling apart is critical. So the sooner we get on this, the better. And we have, you know, the longer we wait to find out if there will be a second wave is the closer we get to finding out there will be a second wave. So um, okay, so pivoting to the new money conversation. Uh, and I'm gonna, do you have the capital project presentation handy? I do. Um, do you just wanna run through that real quick for us? Sure, I, I wanna step back a little bit, you know, for as a, re a review for people. Uh, and this, this spreadsheet really looks at all of our capital project funds, capital reserve, uh, and then the new money we issued in 2014 um, and 19. Uh, and basically this shows nine, this current year spending 2.5 million, uh, recall the projects that we did. Um, and 2021 spending 3.6 million, uh, largest being the unit ventilators at Lorraine and Jacksonwald, uh, and then some playground uh, repair or replacement that haven't, haven't, hasn't been done yet, the principals have been bringing um, that forth. Uh, carpet replacement, which throughout the district, uh, that, is, that is, you know, in process, we have the quotes, uh, and then the a want and sell booster that's in process. So it's 3.6 million. So at the end of uh, next fiscal year, we'll, capital funds will be at about 3.9 million, which really equates to what's in our capital reserve. Uh, and capital reserve, there's that, those funds accumulate uh, from excess in general fund that the board decides to transfer to capital reserve for smaller projects. Um, so that there's no timeline on that in terms of compared to when you issue new money through bonds, uh, you've that three year window. So uh, the next slide really looks at um, spending that will take place from 21, 22 to 24, 25. Uh, we have a unit ventilator project at the junior high uh, again, these numbers need to be uh, updated because they're a couple years old. So that's almost 2 million. If we decide to do it all in one or two years, um, it could be spread out even further. 22, 23, and these are things from our, our uh, facility study that was done by KCBA, replacing the auditorium seating at the junior high. Uh, in 22-23. Senior high, we have some cooling tower and chillers that need to be replaced. Um, and then um, some extensive sidewalk work uh, at the senior high. Uh, and Lorraine, some burners, um, boiler plant replacement. So that next fiscal year, we're looking at a million. Um, nothing specific in 23-24 of a larger scale. 24-25, uh, the stadium, in field, uh, the turf uh, needs to be replaced and then some additional HVAC work, the junior high. So over that period, we're looking at additional $3.6 million. Now we have a number of projects that require uh, additional review. Uh, we talked about weatherproofing in the KCBA study of about 500,000. Dehumidica dehumidification at the high school. Um, the principals had concerns about that and um, further investigation on does the Riften geothermal well fields need to be, uh, you know, looked at uh, for, in terms of performance. Uh, a Watton uh, principals requested another playground um, and security cameras. Uh, and again, we're just getting restarted on a looking at a transportation center um, and the HVA system at this building. So 
there are projects on the horizon and I'm sure principals will have more uh, that they will bring forth, you know, uh, each year, in the next few years. Uh, so that's 700,000. So sorry about the small print here, but I can read it. So in summary, um, you know, by the end of 23, 24, we're pretty much exhausting all of our, or we'll have 1 million left in capital funds uh, and projects needing review, 700,000. And then uh, there's additional projects in 24, 25 through 27, 28. Um, and trying to maintain a capital reserve balance of 3 million, uh, and which says, okay, should we borrow 3.6 million? And basically what you wanna do, if you're borrowing new money now, you're preserving your capital reserve funds uh, for a lot of different projects. And, you know, and again, this doesn't include the transportation center. So new, these new funds could be used for the transportation center, if that gets kicks off sooner than later, as well as some of these other projects um, that, you know, the unit ventilators in 21, 22, uh, ones that have a, a longer life. So I've showed this before, the 3.6 million. Um, but are there any questions on that? I guess I would just ask two things uh, under under a new administration, will we take sort of a step back and relook at the KCBA findings and perhaps reprioritize them, number one? And again, just, you know, it's a prerogative, you know, of, of new leadership. Um, two, um, Jamie, is there any limitation? It would sound to me that the limitation would probably be associated with the need to commit uh, to projects within a three year period, but is there any? limitation as to how much money you can take. You put two scenarios up there, but could there be a scenario that says 5 million or 7 million? Uh, not right, not, so the, the two things that drive your, your borrowing needs, it would be a borrowing based calculation, which is a Pennsylvania rule. You have plenty of borrowing capacity. So there's not, you don't have to worry about that limit. Uh, then really the second part is just really a cash flow side of things. So as long as you can show that you've got reasonable expectations to spend the money over a certain period of time, you know, you, you have room to, to add more if necessary. And that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you, you can't do it in future years either. It's just, you know, it's a question of, do you like, you know, do you like locking in rates in the 1% in the range? And probably the answer is yes to that. You know, that's, that's, of course, what's really driving this conversation, I suspect. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that we do that. I'm just asking about scenarios. Yeah, we, we, the, the issue we would have had potentially would be if we were trying to fit within you know, bank qualification, which means anything less than $10 million. We, we blew through that, obviously, with the, with the refinancing. So for this calendar year, there's nothing we need to worry about. Okay, thank you. And uh, this slide really just illustrates, and it's column I and L. Uh, you've asked this before. I mean, there's savings estimated for 2021 of 255,000. Issue new money of two and a half million. The debt service is approximately 37. We're, you know, in the positive or to 218,000. So, uh, it's it's really the scenarios are favorable in terms of uh, the impact on the budget for debt service at both 2.5 and 3.6. I'll add one thing that I know it's very hard to predict, but you know, one thing that of course drives the cost of projects is really just, you know, the, the actual contracts that you're dealing with and you know, the economy itself. And, you know, I think projects can move up and down depending on you know, when you bid them out and when you're doing them. I mean, I, I you know, if you, I suspect you'd probably get favorable bids on, on certain projects, just given, you know, the economy, and, you know, that's the way I would think things would work out. And again, that, that's, that's a major factor when it comes to, you know, what the cost of the projects are. Clearly rates, we're not going to stop. We, we can't adjust for that, but, but that's one thing I've, I've been seeing clients think about as well as inflationary factors on, on projects. So one of the things that I've been thinking about with this is I think 
that we're going to need to pay for additional projects no matter what. And with the money that exists currently in the capital reserves, I'm of the thought of the mind that we don't currently have enough resources to afford the projects that we see on the horizon until uh, our debt really starts to come off uh, the books um, in a significant way. And I, I do wanna address that in a moment, but because of that, there's, there's two places that, or well, there's three things that we could do. We could not do the projects, which I don't think is a good idea. Um, now we can definitely look at some prioritization or even uh, taking some off the uh, off the schedule, like Mike was alluding to, I think more the first than the second that I described there. Um, we can certainly do that, but I, I don't think canceling some of these projects wholesale would be a good idea. Second, uh, we have the ability to contribute and pay for these projects out of the general fund. Um, the challenge with that is, is that it puts additional pressure on the general fund, which is already have under immense pressure from our operations, wages, benefits, pensions, et cetera. Um, and then the third option is borrowing uh, for additional money, which increases our debt load and is something that we're gonna have to pay back in the long run, no matter what. My feeling here is that we need to build more of a culture in our budget of paying for capital improvements um, from the general fund. Uh, but I don't think that we're ready to go wholesale into that yet. Um, and I think that's why we should look at some combination of borrowing uh, new monies and increasing our commitments from the general fund to uh, the capital uh, budget or, or the capital projects. The reason I think that that's really important is because we're going to be looking at a period in, in less than 10 years where there is almost $8 million of assets uh, or resources that are just gonna become liquid quickly in this current financial outlook that we have. Um, and in my thinking, if we can preserve that and protect that and really utilize uh, those resources to afford future capital improvements outside of new construction for buildings, which is probably something that could happen in the future, that we would really be setting ourselves up for a lot of success. And for that reason, I think we really need to focus on not elongating our debt and not overly burdening it, burdening it where we're putting projects off because we are waiting for the money to free up later. Um, so I threw a lot out there, uh, let other people talk for, um, for what it's worth or if they have any questions about what I, what I just said. can't make that much sense. I can't have made that much sense. Somebody has to have something to say. Uh, well, I mean, I've said this to you. I think it's unrealistic to think that we're going to pay for capital through an operating budget that is going to be routinely at flatlined or, 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 or below. So, so um, I, I don't know how, I don't know if we're going to be able to cut that much expense out of the system to do that. And I would ask Jamie, I mean, you know, um, our, you know, I mean, for-profit companies are probably returning their profits back to, to shareholders, but, you know, it seemed to be the most capital projects company, especially companies, especially with rates where they are going to finance those things and save that cash for other things. Yeah. I, I think, you know, just the, the general view. Is that fair? Yeah. That, yeah. Am I mute? Yeah. The, the general viewpoint that I've seen from, you know, as a firm we've seen is, especially during this time, we've seen people prioritize certain projects that make most sense, you know, take advantage of the market where they can. And if, you know, if necessary, um, you know, recapitalize, you know, the viewpoints, you know, what, where the future is going to hold for your company or your, or your district. I mean, there's, there's so many viewpoints of, you know, where the future is going to be. I think many districts and townships, you know, taking a long view to kind of make, projections, and I know Ann does her own projections, 
um, of speculating, you know, where the economy is going to go and what the impact is from an operational side. And I do think right now cash is king. So I think trying to maintain as much cash probably makes a lot of sense given certain uncertainties. Yes, you pay interest on your debt clearly, um, but you know, for emergencies, having them kind of having money in hand is really what drives things, and that's what keeps your rating up too. You know, spending down reserves um, is an issue, uh, and and I will say, you know, Moody's and and S and P are following along with uh, economies and making sure that people are, you know, their impacts on you know EIT or you know real estate transfer taxes, you know, things that drive certain municipalities to make sure that they're seeing the trends going in a at least a flat or, or a reasonable direction. And, you know, there could be pressures, you know, next year or in the future for, for other things that are happening today. So I would suspect that the, the more you do with projecting your, projecting your cash, protecting your ca cash is, is probably what makes sense. Can I add a, a comment, uh, Hunter? Yeah. You know, it, you know, Mike referenced, you know, in a new administration. And, you know, I certainly think that um, in just my 10 days, I've gotten to see a lot of capital needs around the district and heard that from uh, many of the administrators. I, you know, and I've, you know, I've been around districts for a long period of time and I've attended a million bond, uh, you know, call meetings <laughs> a lot with PFM. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, it's an ultimately a board decision, no question. Um, and you have to think of a lot of factors, but you know, seeing money available at 1%, I can say, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen it, um, or you know, even close in, in these situations. You know, there's been a lot of conversation about you know, the transportation uh, facility and the need to do that. Um, and so the, in my mind as superintendent, the opportunity to take out new money at these rates with the amount of needs that we have to make sure that we are investing wisely now uh, at smaller sums than having to rebuild, you know, buildings later because we haven't done that is just fiscally sound. Um, and so, you know, I think, I do think having cash on hand is really important. I'm very concerned about, um, you know, the amount of money that we have on hand and as well as making sure that we're maintaining our facilities. So for what it's worth, I'm supportive of the board, um, you know, taking out the amount of money that is at the upper end of their comfort range uh, because of the rates and because of what I see on the future horizon in terms of our capital and cash needs. I guess my, my biggest question is how do we, how do we determine given so many uncertainties uh, what that number is? Uh, if we decide to borrow more money, I guess the question is how much more do we need to borrow? I mean, we won't we won't have a cost on the transportation a cost estimate on the transportation center for some time. We only recently authorized uh, uh, the company to do what's necessary to get us between here and applying to the township for a variance. Um, so again, since I'm I'm new at all this, I'll draw on everybody's prior experience. How how do you go about? Figuring out a number to give to Jamie to say, okay, let's refund, let's add X millions of dollars. How, how do we do that? Well, and I think that's why it's a judgment call too. And I, you know, Anne, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're of the mind at this point that a good conservative option would be 3.6 million in that second scenario. Is that is that correct? I uh, yes, and. You know, that's really, you know, that could be could be comprised of projects that are not inclusive of the transportation center, uh, the two million in the junior high unit ventilators, and the variety of projects in 22, 23, and the ones that were are still are under review. So, you know, right there, uh, you're, you're at 3.6 million. 1.9 and a million and, and 600,000. Um, yeah. That's from my perspective, but it, again, uh, you know, there probably will be a need somewhere down the road to issue more funds, just depending on uh, you know, what projects 
really come on the horizon. Well, and I think I think that that's why this this conversation is really critical because ultimately it is a judgment call. Um, you know that that two point five million scenario was here at my request because my uh, thinking with that number of issuing new money is that we have to figure out how to close the gaps that exist on paper that may not be there when we actually come to the projects being bid out themselves. And that's where we're creating that culture of relying more on general fund. And, and Mike, you cut out a little bit before. So if I say anything that isn't correctly attributed to you, please correct me. But I think what I was hearing you say is that there's a lot of pressure already on our general funds. So where are we gonna find that money? And I, I certainly agree with that, but I think that we have to move towards that type of fiscal discipline where we're actively using our money that we have from taxes that we get every year to start paying for those things. And you know, in my mind, that looks like 200,000, 250,000 more a year that we're making in commitments from the general fund to try and close these gaps over eight years. Because I really think if we can preserve that liquidity in, in 29, uh, that we're going to have a lot of ability to build up that fund balance where the only time we're going to have to borrow for the foreseeable future would be for new construction. And I think we also have to recognize too, and, and this is my thinking, is that the reason we have this type of debt load is because we have built new buildings and there's a domino effect for having to borrow because we borrowed before, so we don't have the cash on hand, so we need to bring in more money for some of these lower projects. And we, there's a very large likelihood of uh, you know, having to build or even to do additions to some of our existing facilities um, in, in the future, in, in my lifetime. Um, and, and whether that's 20 years down the road, whether that's 40 years down the road, uh, you know, we don't know. But I also don't want to see us continually use borrowing to pay for these small projects. And then we get to the construction of a new school that's at 65, 70 million dollars, and then we're adding those bonds on top of what we already have. So that that's kind of where my motivation is here in saying that I think that we need to move towards some of that discipline that our that our operating budget does more to support our capital improvements. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll say again, I will say that unless we're having significant surpluses we're not gonna be able to support the capital projects that need to get done. And um, believe me, I'm all for financial discipline. I totally get it. Um, but I think Jamie made a good point. I mean, you know, and, and Dr. Miner did as well. I mean, you know, we have to be careful about how far we fall behind, you know, in our capital projects in terms of maintaining them where we find ourselves delaying, delaying and delaying in a project that costs 2 million this year you know, cost, you know, three and a half million, four years from now. Um, so I, I think we have to understand, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, but you, you're, you're also saying that you don't think we'll have financial discipline if we borrow money. And, you know, I'm saying is that, you know, a lot of people, you know, very successful people, um, you know, use other people's money uh, to, to help to, you um, you know, get projects done. And when you look at the rates that we have now, um, you know, I just think we're going to, we're going to make a mistake if we don't think, but again, financial rigor, financial discipline, I get it. Um, but, you know, <laughs> we're going into a year where we're going to be spending more money than ever on things we never thought we were going to be spending money on before either. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I understand that. And, you know, one of the things that uh, Jamie and Kim said resonated with me as well. So I think, you know, if there's a disagreement between us, it's really about what amount that we're looking at for new money. Um, yeah. Would you think that that's fair? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see a disagreement. I see sort of a different way of looking at things. But I think we're both for trying to figure out where we can save money. Um, I think we're both for not you know, taking an excessive amount of money. But I think to get back to Mr. Fiddler's question, um, we haven't had that discussion about how we're gonna prioritize things. And mm -hmm. with Dr. Miner here, and what she's telling us is that she's getting out around the district and she's hearing about capital projects. I'd really like for
for us to, you know, as quickly as we can, maybe review those projects from KCBA and see, you know, there might not be Hunter there, but to see if there's any, you know, uh, uh, need or reason to prioritize certain things, especially in light of what we're dealing with right now with COVID. I, I would just like to add an, another comment, if I may. I, I just want to revisit the, the one the one percent right now, and thinking about taking money out at some later time. And and I think just ask all of yourselves, um, or ask yourselves rather. You know, have have you seen rates at you know at one percent often? Do you expect to see them again moving forward? I mean, Jamie can certainly comment on that. And I think part of fiscal responsibility is not paying a significant amount of debt service to interest rates. And the idea that we can take out money that we're not paying to interest rates, but paying to principal because we're talking about a 1% versus future issuances to do the transportation center or something else where we're back to more typical interest rates. You know, again, that's, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars that are going to pay somebody else's interest to line someone else's pockets that aren't being used to capital improvements in the district. So, I mean, you know, I'm not a financial expert, but you know, maybe Jamie or Ann can weigh in on um, just how big of an impact, you know, taking an interest rate opportunity like this can have. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, it's it's certainly unfathomable to say that we've we're going to be at these rates for a, a long period of time. I, certainly, I think if the economy stays, you know, in a, in a position where the market's just not getting moving again, we'll probably maintain low rates for for a period of time, and that's. You know, that, that maybe gives you, I hate to say comfort level on the debt side, but certainly not comfort level on everything else that matters because you need people to be able to afford paying back your debt service as well. So, you know, it's, you know, I want, if you go back to one of the original charts that I sent out and no reason to look at it, but the current rate we have, even if rates went up 50 basis points, we, we were better, you know, since 1993, like, you know, hundred percent of the time, hundred percent of the time, like rates are just so, so low right now. It's, it's, you, you just don't see anything like this. Even if it went up a hundred basis points, rates were, you know, higher 99.31% of the time. It's just, it's crazy <laughs> where the market is right now. Uh, so I, I don't disagree with you. I'm obviously, I'm in the debt business, so it's hard for me not to say that, but um, you know, I, I've been doing this for 20 years and we had you know, two spouts where this was this low, this one and, you know, back in I think 19, 2018, which was really low too. And, and I remember when I first started, you know, we were looking at four or 5% rates and we're like, okay, we're never going to do refinancing again. And, and look where we are today. So it's, uh, it's, it's very unique in that sense. I, I, I want to add one thing that, that Hunter brought up and, and, you know, just kind of from a philosophical conversation, I know you guys have probably a debt, I think we have a debt policy in place, but you know, there's a delicate balance of what you spend cash on versus what you finance. And you know, I think the way I've seen issuers and school districts think about things, if you have something that is a short-term useful life, those are the things that you balance that you would pay cash for. Again, how many of those things you have? You know, you Chromebooks, you've got you know, maybe buses, you've got things like that that probably fall into that kind of immediate needs of a different program of what you can you can use cash for. When you're talking about buildings and playground, you know, some of those things are kind of longer term. So I think that's the way I would think about things if you're going to go down the road of thinking about fiscal responsibility in the future, where the world when the world comes back to normal, you know, that's where I would put your put your your cash in is the short term type of things. That's that's my two cents. Well, I'd just like, I'd like to say that I'm not so sure whether we're borrowing enough money. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because I think about the discussions we've had with our administration building, the Lausch building, which has not been touched in terms of renovations since it was built from what I can tell. Um, I mean, we've done spot repairs and patch jobs on that building. We have dedicated that building as an administrative center uh, we see it as being incredibly inefficient in terms of how it's used. Um, it is not, you know, a comfortable facility for our administration or or other groups that have to, you know, use that that particular building. And I think it's due for a major renovation. Um, and I personally would like to see sufficient, you know, funds borrowed to be able to accommodate that project as well, which would be, I think, the estimate. <laughs> 
um, unfortunately was really very rough, anywhere between a million and, and even up to $5 million, which I think is maybe way over the top, but you know, I would say conservatively a couple of million dollars you know, to renovate that building to the way that it really should be renovated if we're gonna dedicate it and use it as an administration building. I mean, clearly we're not gonna repurpose it anymore for a school. We're not, we don't, we see no trends toward increased enrollment. Um, and it doesn't make us make sense for us to, to build an administration building, you know, anywhere else uh, or to purchase a property anywhere else that would be suitable for an administration building. It's clearly set up as a, as a school, not as a administrative facility. Uh, so um, work has to be done as far as I'm concerned. And now that we know that we're not going to be using it as a school, I think, you know, we should take that into consideration, whether it's, you know, it, it's going to be done at some point. I just don't know why we don't move a little bit more aggressively on it because whether we do it now, we do it, you know, in two years, five years, 10 years, it has, it really needs to be done at some point from my, and again, giving you my perspective on it. I think it's one of the last projects that we have and it's been neglected. You know, just, in, in the same vein as the transportation center has been neglected for years and years and years. I just don't wanna see, you know, Lausch continue with that same pattern of, 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 of neglect over time or, uh, or this whole idea of, of just uh, putting money into a facility that is you know, clearly not purposed the way it should be right now. Just, just a couple comments from my end. And, you know, I, often when I attend these meetings, I do a lot of listening because I don't consider the financial side of things my area of expertise by, by any means. But the one thing that I will say is that, you know, I think that anytime you're, you're faced with a crisis and the pandemic certainly qualifies as that, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to look at how you're doing things and look at what you're doing and be able to use it, you know, potentially as a positive. And I think that, you know, one of the things that has happened as a result of this is where we are with the interest rates. And, you know, back to, back to Mike's point about prioritization, if the combination of low interest rates and being able to prioritize projects enables us now to very strategically do some projects and do them right and do them well that will put us in a position you know, long term to meet those different needs, then, you know, I think it would be very, very wise to, you know, take out the funds to be able to do that once we identify what those prioritized items are. You know, I think, I think that's well said, Patrick. Um, you know, the only, and I, I don't think this is a disagreement, but I, my only concern is too, you know, we're looking at an opportunity for new money here. I don't want what happens is to say, well, all the projects that we could think of that have good merit can now fit into this. And, you know, hearing interest rates have been historically low is something I've heard probably the entire time I've been coming to school board meetings. And, and you know, it's getting longer as years go on. Now, will they get lower than this? I, I don't know if they will. Um, you know, I, but, you know, in Europe, they have negative interest rates for a lot of borrowing. I don't know if that directly applies to municipal bond markets, uh, but it's not impossible that rates would go lower than this. So, you know, I'm not sure if that rings as, and, and this is just me, I'm not speaking for everybody else. I'm not sure if that, that part of the argument is as important as others are in terms of knowing what we're gonna do and, and if that's an efficient use. Um, because I, I think, you know, each of our principals is gonna passionately advocate advocate for things that are in their buildings. Um, you know, we, we have a, uh, I will say a very good, in, instead of using any type of charged word, elementary school that was most recently built. And there's a lot of people in the community, I think that will, would go through that building and ask, you know, why did it need to be this impressive? Um, and I just wanna make sure that we're, we're avoiding avoiding doing something like that for some of these projects too. And I, I don't think that that discounts what you're saying, because I, I hear you, you know, I just want us to be cognizant of that as well. No, I agree. I think that's a good point, Hunter. Jamie, can I ask a question? Um, when we've issued new money in over the past few years, we always had a very um, good grasp on what projects we were going to do. We had a, uh, a, a study and, you know, estimates. Um, 
and maybe this is a question for Peter Edelman. I mean, we have some projects, but people are talking about, you know, the transportation center, which our late, latest estimates from 2014, and we don't even know if we're going to get an exception. Talking about the administration building, my question is, how solid uh, does your plan have to be when you are issuing new money? Well, you know, obviously you have a, you know, a a capital list, right? That shows right. You know, X amount of dollars that, you know, that you can, you can come up with a pretty easy list of how much money you really need. Using some expertise on that knowledge from whether it's a, from 2014 or from 20, 2020, you know, everyone knows it will never be exactly what you thought it was gonna be whenever you did it. Um, I think that the issue you really have more, I think I've seen where people say, we're gonna borrow money now. And then, you know, in two years you go through the process and you need more. So you're like, oh my God, I spent money on cost of issuance and everything else and I gotta come back and do it again. I don't know if there's a fear of that here considering how many other things you potentially would need. So whether it's two and a half or three and a half, I think you, I think you guys are gonna have enough needs for the money. I think from Peter's standpoint, it really is just a question of, if you think you're going to spend the money within three years reasonably, that's what drives the tax issue. Everything else is really comes down to, do you borrow enough or did you not borrow enough? And, you know, I, I think you're probably, you'd probably be okay one way or the other, depending on what, you know, the two and a half or three and a half, clearly based on what you have in the projects. Can I ask just one quick follow-up to that? And then I do want to read, there was a comment slash question from a resident that I, that I want to, pivot to and just um, have have that read quick. Uh, will we be able between now and that 2029 date when our bonds really look to be coming off uh, to refinance again? And and the reason I ask that is because that's the prime opportunity for us to issue new money. Yeah. So I was earlier when Anne was going through the, the, the uh, her list. I was eyeballing all the call dates going forward. And you might remember we did that first issue, which took out a significant amount of your money and, and that's callable in 2023. We added an option to, to refinance. It's not gonna refinance for savings. I mean, knock on wood. I mean, it's at one something percent, but if we go to Europe, maybe, maybe we will. Um, but the next- Hopefully not, <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> um, but yeah, really the next time you're really gonna refinance and I, I wouldn't, it's a relatively short issue. I don't think it has really, really high coupons, but it's your 2017 bonds that has a call date in 2022. And then after that, the next time, you know, it's, it's really that one we just did. And then you have one in 2027. So there's generally speaking, there's not a, a this may be it for a little while um, from a real saving standpoint. So right. I think we are kind of picking a time to do it now because there may not be any real savings coming in the future. Uh, let me just, oh, wow, there are a lot of questions coming in here. Okay. Um, so we have two questions. Well, one's a comment. Um, two questions from Jennifer Harvey, a resident of the township. Is there a penalty on early repayment? Uh, if there is no penalty on early repayment, isn't it wise to take out more than needed and cut it close, period? Uh, then the second email. The idea of renovating Lausch to make it fancy after cutting the gifted program 50% in the last five years, that's the stuff that angers parents. I worked in a closet for years at a hospital. Not great, definitely not cushy, but I had what I needed to do the job. You do not need the admin building to be fancy. If students and teachers get program cuts, admin should have renovated, shouldn't have renovated the space. Exeter places too much on looks, concentrate on function, needs, should be priority right now, not once. Um, you know, uh, I'll, Jennifer, I'll, comment I think... on, I'll, I'll comment on that too. Okay. You know, one of the things about the administration building is that we're 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 providing the HVAC services in, for an entire building um, that is designed for occupancy of probably around 500 individuals. And we actually have about, what do we have? Maybe 25 or 30 folks who actually inhabit that building. So, you know, we're spending enormous costs 
to kind of heat and cool, you know, the building because of the way it's it's currently um, set up, and it hasn't been changed since it's been an elementary school. These are the kind of basic functional changes that really have to have. We're we're wasting money, you know, in keeping it open as well because we're we're we're, we're sort of not taking advantage of some of the efficiencies that would be available if we were to kind of reformat, you know, the setup. And the whole idea is to kind of move you know, the administration into it, you know, all the administration and virtually everybody's working in that building into half of the building and use and use the building more, much more efficiently. Um, so there's some, it's not just about aesthetics. It's not just about making it a prettier, you know, kind of building. There's a functional aspect to it too that I think is really important because it's a, right now it's a, it's a pretty significant energy waste from what I can tell. And I, I'll just say too that, you know, I, I've heard it from Dr. Miner already you know, we're not going to borrow money to make nice offices for administrators. That would not be the purpose of what we're doing here. Um, to your first question about repayment, you know, that's really an opinion, um, one that you're you're fine to have. And I'll, I'll Jamie, if you could address quick um, after this, uh, you know, whether you're able to repay some of these before they are due. Um, you know, I, my opinion would be is that you wouldn't borrow more than you need. And that, that's really my motivation behind wanting to be more conservative, but your, your, your point is well made. You know, it's certainly an opinion that others may have as well. But Jamie, do you just want to quickly address early repayment? Yeah, I mean, with this particular financing, because it's going to be non-bank qualified, which is that which means it's over $10 million, the call provision on the bonds will probably be at earliest seven or eight years, if not non-callable. So um, if there is, you know, if you, if you wanted to pay it back, this particular issue, you, it would have to wait at least seven or eight years, which makes things a little bit inefficient. So uh, unlike like a mortgage where it's prepayable in any time without penalty and even some bank loans we've done, uh, you know, if a bond issue of this size would have a longer call provision. Jamie, can I, can I ask a follow up on that? Sure. If you wanted to, you know, repay something, I mean, is that recent bank refinance something that we could repay early instead of this particular funding um, in the way that the, the comment suggested? Yeah, I mean, if you have extra cash, there, you know, whether that's this issue or something, there's there's other opportunities. The the 2020 issue we just did has a 2023 call on it, but we have a, you know, actually that bank loan will be gone by next year. But there is, you know, there's a couple of issues out there that have a call provision a little sooner. I mean, if that if that was a real problem, we could probably find some solutions to, to paying back debt. It just, it's just the question of how efficient is it is the more important question. So, uh, I want to, Hunter, just a quick question. When we Perfect. did our assessment of Lausch, I mean, Dave's right. We got 25, 30 people in the building that holds 500. Have we given any consideration to renting space somewhere? I know Dr. Phillips had uh, some concepts about that. I don't know if the idea was ever flushed out um, into a real, you know, written format. One of the things that we talked about, we know that right now the health trust is considering uh, putting in place some regional um, clinics. And one, one of the locations was in um, the Exeter area. And so, you know, in theory, one part could be to kind of repurpose part of that building for something like that, or to be utilized for other community, you know, based, um, you know, uh, companies who might want to rent some of the space. Uh, right now, it's not, I mean, that, that, that building, the condition of that building is embarrassing. Uh, to go in and to call that a professional building, uh, professional office space is a joke. Um, and it's not going to change. It's not going to change. It's going to be that way this year, five years and 10 years until we do something about it. And it's just not a matter of rearranging the furniture. It's structurally uh, in the interior, which isn't a complicated fix, but the interior really needs to be, you know, completely, you know, raised and repurposed, you know, for the per and and the HVAC system has to be kind of modified. It can be done, and I think it can be it can be something that we could be proud of without necessarily an enormous, you know, cost to the school district. But you you'll need to have to borrow some money to do that, I believe. Um, and so, and, and, I, and if we want to use it and take advantage of, as Mike might be alluding to, you know, for other, other purposes where it could generate some revenue, uh, we'll never do it in the condition that it's in right now. Can I just add one, I apologize to jump in. 
one comment to any time if you do obviously i don't think that building has any debt against it anymore because it's probably a number of years old if you were to do some bond issue or financing tax-free that renovated the building and it and you rented it out to a for-profit there could be some tax implications on the debt itself so that would be a conversation in the future if that were to happen so it's kind of a multi-step thought process um, I just want to point that out just for purpose of discussion. But that's, it, it, it certainly happens. Um, so it depends on who you're putting in there um, is the question. And, and how many, how much space they take up as well. So that's, that's my only comment to that. So um, I think, is there, is there anything that anybody wants to add on, on the principle of the conversation? Because what I'd like to do next with the time we have available is maybe just to see where board members are in terms of a number and see if there's any pattern that emerges there. Um, but if anybody wants to add anything on the principle, I think that would be helpful at this point. I'd like to add some well, on the principle. Man, I just want to go back to Jen Harvey's questions for a second. I mean, she. She does make a valid point about perception. Um, you know, we need to be careful about what we're putting money into just from a public perception perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, we ostensibly exist to educate kids in the community. And regardless, you know, I know Dave's saying you're not going to put a lot of money into that building, but it needs, it needs work. Uh, you, know, you know, putting money into any office over a child becomes a public relations issue. So, and a legitimate one. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it, you could say the same thing about the transportation center as well. I mean, these are all things that are, these are part of our, of our facilities. I mean, they're all important. Obviously where kids go to school has a high level important because that's where, you know, the, the instructions provided, but I mean, uh, how far do we let our buildings fall apart? We've seen what's happened to the transportation center. It's, it's the biggest disgrace in the school district. And second to that really is the Lausch building. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about trying to make these into state of the art, you know, facilities. These are clearly in, 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 in the process of deteriorating, falling apart and haven't been touched you know, in, in terms of any renovations, it's, 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 it's sad. And it's, I think it's unsuitable for a district, the caliber of Exeter. Um, so, I mean, I, and that's my perception only. I, I'm sharing how I feel about it. I'm, I, I think it's an embarrassment. Um, we sit, we bring people into, we bring all kinds of people in that administration building. We bring politicians, we bring parents and families for registration into that building. This is where people come the first, this is their first impression of the school district when they come to that building. This is how we operate, you know, and it, it means something, you know, and, and if we consider, you know, our schools to be our biggest asset in this community, what are we saying then when we have, you know, some of these buildings that are just falling, falling, falling apart or, uh, you know, clearly subpar. So. Um, well, I think, I think there's a lot of agreement between the positions that are being laid out. I think the, the differences probably will arise and maybe fall even in those details when we get farther down the line. Um, but at this point, I, I don't think that anybody wants to add anything in terms of their interest behind a position. So I'm wondering if we can move to try and seeing if, if there's an agreement around a number at this point that we can, you know, start discussing and, and, really tacking on and, and Kim, I'd invite you to add a number if, if you'd like to, as the 10th member of the team, um, not all 10 are here, <laughs> but uh, um, you know, just to start it off, I, I'm really reluctant to move above that two five, um, but I think for the sake of discussion and also deference to our administrators who are far wiser than I am. And maybe I'm not always the most humble about expressing that. Um, I, I think that going to 3.6 would be acceptable for me. And can you just remind me what the quote was for the transportation center in 2014, just as a reference point? 
it was probably around um, based on the design that we had at that point and including uh, land improvements and solve costs, you know, upwards of 3.7 million. Thank you. So that that upper figure would would essentially, you know, uh, you know, if we were to move forward with that transportation center, conservatively, it would be three point six, three point seven million dollars. I mean, considering I know that we're going to, you know, make efforts to scale it back and to try to be as conservative as we can, you know, in terms of the design and the structure itself. But you know, my assumption would be with, you know, construction rates that always seem to increase on an annual basis it's going to be at least that amount of money, I would think. So that will absorb any, any 3.6, you know, that $3.6 million, you know, bond issue. I mean, just from that project alone. So I, I would, I would advocate at, the, at a minimum of 3.6. I would, I would advocate for more, but I would say at a minimum, you know, my comfort level would start at 3.6. Dave, do you want to put a number out there as, as what your preference would be, or do you want to stick with 3.6? I mean, if our assumption is, you know, that that 3.6 is, is really going to be absorbed by the transportation center, and that leaves us another million, you know, in capital reserve at, at the end of, what is it, 22, 23, um, that doesn't leave very much wiggle room uh, from my perspective. That doesn't really... Um, and, and, if, and, if, and if this is a rare opportunity to, to, to build up our capital reserve, I would put another million dollars into it. So I'm gonna put you down for 4.6. Put me down for 4.6. Uh, excuse me, uh, Jamie has a 7.30 meeting. Jamie, if you need to uh, leave, but I'll let you be the judge of What's best? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give it another five minutes or so and then uh, okay. I'll jump down south. Thank you. So the 3.6 is does not include, if I remember the number on one of your sheets, and does not include the transportation center. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. But it's also preserving, that's correct. Okay. So I guess, Annie, would it be fair to say that if the intention was to, in fact, build the transportation center, we're going to use the 2014 number, recognizing that costs have gone up, but our scope of the project has gone down because we want to be more conservative. And to do what you were, were saying in terms of keeping our capital reserves intact, as well as doing the, the projects that have already been identified, you would be really talking about a $7.2 million clear the garage and do what you were suggesting in terms of capital, which I'm not throwing out 7.2, I'm not a board member, but I just want to clarify that the transportation center plus your recommendation is actually a 7.2 total if we really wanted to get them wrapped up at this time, which we may or not may not want to do because we don't have, you know, a variance or build the transportation center. But I just want to make sure everybody's thinking in the same line about uh, how that money, you know, how you presented that those funds. Is that, is that accurate, Ann? That's accurate, but because that's maintaining $3 million in capital reserve. Right, so prudence dictates that we don't want to borrow an additional $3.6 million on a project that might not be approved at the township level, correct? Okay, thank yeah, you. I, I think that's probably from a risk standpoint, even from a, uh, a bond council standpoint, probably makes sense to hold off until you have Given the history of that this particular project, I would recommend you you hold right. off next month. Okay. Is, that, is that history known to you or something? <laughs> I well, let me ask a question related to that though. If if that is indeed the case, um, and we're pressured with time to take advantage of the rates, I mean, we're not going to get approval for something that quickly. It's true. So, yeah, I'm not sure what the timeline is, e even on, you know, 
getting the architectural work done to, to get the, uh, the property, you know, adequately um, prepared for presenting, you know, a variance argument discussion with the township. Well, it, so that, it shouldn't take more than a few months um, if we're resolved behind the project. But the other thing, as long as there's not a time requirement on that variance, which there very rarely is, you know, we can do that as long as we own the property and it remains in its current condition. So if we got a variance in January and there wasn't any type of time restriction, we could build in 2025. I'm not suggesting that, but you know, it's, it's not like once we have that variance, we've only got 90 days to start the project or something. Yeah, that just comes back to the tax question of reasonable expectation to spend the money within three years. I think that's more of the, the question I would think about. Yeah, that, that's what I was, that's what I was, that's what I meant, Jamie. You know, the timing is just a little bit off here. Could we, could we agree the, the board members that are here that it's not likely that we could get a huge amount of clarity around, you know, the administration building projects and if they were to occur and the transportation center project, if it were to occur in the next month or so, which is when we'd like to ideally target for new issuance. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, go ahead. Kim. No, you go, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I, I don't know whether or not as, you know, AEM goes through the process of, you know, developing some of these plans, just how able they would be to project costs associated with those, because I would anticipate within the next couple of months, we would start to see some plans coming in. Um, my, but my, I don't know if that's part of the, the arrangement and maybe you know better, you know, what we could anticipate when they would provide us with their architectural rendering of a concept, whether that comes with a, um, a cost estimate. Yeah, there will be cost estimates. Yeah. But we don't know what the timeline is. We have no idea what the timeline is at this point right now for. No, we, uh, we'll be scheduling a meeting very soon. Bill Weinbach is out of out of town this week, but getting our team together, administrative team, to kick, to kick it off. Would it be possible, Anne, to send an email to us or even report at it at the board meeting next Tuesday if we could get a cost estimate before the fourth? Your office. Uh, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Well, um, then, sorry, go ahead, Kim. Well, I just, I want to make uh, two comments. One's related and one is kind of a, a throwback. One is to get anything done, frankly, when, um, you know, the administrative team has to plan to open schools in the, in the middle of a pandemic and, and have us really be functioning participants in that. I, I don't think is a reasonable expectation. I don't feel like I could give you the quality of time and nor could Anne that would really need to be devoted to, um, to doing our part in that. Um, number two, I just would like to revisit Anne. On your spreadsheet, the 3.6 issuance still represented, a, a, and I, I, I might've seen it wrong or, or remembered it wrong, represented a savings in terms of what we pay right now prior to the savings that we'll realize through the the debt refinancing. Is that, is that correct? Because the savings is greater than the additional debt that would be incurred. So, so my question is, do you have a number in terms of the debt that we would take out that would be a net zero in terms of the savings that we, that, that Jamie is predicting that we would, I know obviously that, you know, varies day to day, but with the current rate and the debt service, I mean, that might be one thing that the board wants to take into consideration if is it is, is, is the number um, you know, if we're going to just take out the transportation center and take out the admin buildings, we can't really get the numbers. Does it make sense to take out a number when we know we have a list of expensive projects? We know there's probably more that is a net as close to a net zero in terms of currently what we're paying in the budget for debt 
um, and what new money would be in the budget for debt. I'm just curious what that number is. Do you have an idea? At the 3.6 million uh, in year one, 2021, there's a positive 204,000, but the, 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 the years that follow uh, are pretty much, you could call them zero until we get to 2027 when there's a, a 150,000. But again, you know, what I think the district should do in 2021 is, you know, that reduction in debt service, uh, really transfer that money into capital reserve to you know, kind of infuse, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Take those savings. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just jump in. I mean, I think it's kind of pure dumb luck by you know the way we've structured the savings and the amount that on the 3.6 is essentially fits exactly with kind of what you were paying where you are paying. I was not planned that way. It just kind of worked out that way. Well, I, I would agree with with Anne's suggestion. You know, I think I think Kim trying to maximize our issuance. I think is I think what you're getting at. Um, you know, with without any uh, negative impact to the budget. I'm going to bounce off, guys. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. Well, Thanks. I. My, my feeling would be because we know we have these projects and we know that more than likely we're not going to be able to pay for everything that we sitting here right now see um, with new money would be that any savings that we make from this point forward on any of these reissuances or refinancings should be dedicated towards uh, capital expenses. And, you know, I think that the board should be able to take the hit on the chin for that because um, I think we did a little bit with the track uh, but ultimately you know these facilities stand for 50 years more than that sometimes and maintaining them and making sure that we get that lifetime out of them is important and you know the the taxpayers have invested a significant amount of money and and I would I would deem it as eight million dollars because I'm not really sure if there's anything else in our in our borrowing right now that was paying for anything other than capital improvements. So, you know, I think that it's really important that we continue to get ahead of the schedule that KCBA has put out for us. And, and even as Mike suggested, and I think Kim, you may have alluded to this in one of our conversations offline before as well, it, you know, making sure that we're addressing those needs as they come up as well. And I think that it's gonna be really important to use those savings to do that. Which, you know, on the converse also creates more pressure on, on our general fund budget. You know, I don't think that that should be left out of the equation, but I think that it's an important commitment that we need to make. So right now on the table, unless anybody wants to disagree with me, is 3.6 million and 4.6 million for new money issuance. Um, is there any numbers that John or Mike you'd like to introduce or Dr. Minor that you'd like the administration to take a position on? You know, I'm, I'm gonna stand by what I said earlier. You know, I would, it is ultimately the you know, of course, the board's decision, you certainly know the community, you know, all of the history better than I do. What I'm looking at is um, a number of capital projects that are immediately visible. The fact that the rates are 1%, um, the fact that we're close in those numbers of not putting additional strain on the general fund in terms of, um, you know, debt repayment by doing this. So, as I said, I think, you know, near the very beginning, I would encourage the board to, to le lean on the side, the highest side of your comfort level. Uh, if that's 3.6, if that's 4.2, um, you know, we'll, we'll, as administrators, make it work and we'll prioritize and we'll do all those things. I just, I, again, you know, my history watching these things and I, and Hunter, your point's well taken. I've heard a lot of times this is the lowest it's going to get, but one is pretty close to zero, not a lot of room to go, to go below that. And I mean, you know, I don't know about negative in Europe, but, um, so I guess that would be that would be my encouragement. There there are capital projects that need to be done 
that involve safety, that involve the extension of the service life of our facilities, which ultimately will be a savings to our taxpayers and investment in our community um, that unquestionably need to be done. Um, so I think it's really, you know, at the discretion of the board to say, well, what's our comfort level with, with the money? But, um, you know, again, I'm just gonna reemphasize that 1% is, is an amazing opportunity and there's plenty of work uh, to do that ultimately will pay dividends in, in terms of uh, not needing repairs later and not paying uh, higher interest rates that potentially might exist to interest instead of to actual investments in our buildings. You know, I know it sounds like a lot of money, but you know, when you consider building a brand new high school, if we were to ever have to do that, and I don't think we'll ever have to do that in our, certainly in our lifetimes. Knock on wood now. <laughs> 100, maybe yours. $150 million, you know, is probably not out of the ballpark and, and districts have to make those kind of commitments occasionally. We are fortunate right now, our facilities appear to be stable and, and to be suitable for the foreseeable future, well into the foreseeable future. So there's no large scale projects that I think we're seeing. It's primarily bringing the facilities that we have up to standard, up to a reasonable, you know, average standard and to do that i think when you consider that you know 140 million dollar 50 million dollar project against you know what we're talking about it's i think it's a modest investment in our overall you know capital program um so i you know i i believe in continuing to keep up you know these facilities that you know it's uh, obviously you know you know uh as, as people have pointed out, I mean, the instructional program is our priority, but we, you know, and that's always going to be first for us. But, but we also have a commitment to our community and to the investments that we've already, the money we've already put into these facilities. Um, when you let a facility fall apart and fall down, like the transportation center, um, you know, it's a disservice um, to the people that work there. It's a, it's a disservice to the community as an asset. And, uh, and ultimately, it'll, it'll interfere and it'll undermine our, I think, our, our, our rating as a district um, in, in, in financial terms, as well as, you know, in, in, its, in the impression that the people have as, of our district in terms of a, of a valuable place to send, uh, send, st send students in to live. So I, I mean, I, I believe in making these, in the, I know it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not it's not a good time. It's not a good time to talk about raising debt. It's probably the worst time ever, you know, because we're facing a you know, terrible situation. But, you know, there are practicalities here. And certainly affordability of money is probably the biggest thing that I see. Jim, do you have a sense of uh, how many of those projects you just spoke of a few minutes ago, you, you talked about them twice? Um, would, would all of the things you have in mind based on what you've seen, based on the presentations we've had tonight, are we gonna be able to cover those with 3.6 or is there a number that you have in mind that says, gee folks, you really ought to consider X so that we can get all of this done. Um, that, I, that's, the, that's the only question I have at this point. John, you know, I, I, I have to apologize because I've, you know, this, it's July 14th, you know, it's been two calendar days. July holiday and weekends included um, since I, I started at Exeter. And so, you know, I and I am not a facilities expert, nor am I a finance expert, so I can't put a price tag. But what I but what I do think our best estimate and, and is a, a fair and safe estimate is in what Anne has presented is 3.6 is what was already laid out as needs, um, you know, that, that preserves, you know, our capital funds. And I don't think there's anything less than what Ann uh, has laid out. I think the potential is that there's more than. I don't, I, I fairly, I, in just all fairness, I don't, I can't put a number on it. Um, I don't know that I can, because I don't know that it's been thoroughly assessed. But what I'm confident is that it's not going to be less than 3.6. It's going to okay. be, and by the time we do what are already on her list, plus um, the new thing. So I apologize, John, that I can't get no, no. But well, no, I didn't mean for you to come up with you know, 3.89 million or something, but, but I just want, if there was something that you saw somewhere in your, your early tours around the, uh, uh, the district 
uh, or something on the list, you, you know. You I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a lot, there's a lot that I saw, you know. I mean, Christy yeah. Holly had a very, um, you know, very, I think, reasonable explanation for why additional playground space is needed at a Watton Creek. I think there's, you know, roof leaks in a couple of different buildings. I mean, there are there are things that I don't see specifically on Anne's list, but again, you know, I, I would just be throwing out a random number, and so sure. I, you know, I don't want to do but so I, I, let me ask it a different way. Are you confident that the 3.6 would cover the bulk of what you've seen and and based again based on Anne's uh, the, the list that Anne presented of all of those projects? Well, I think if you go back to Anne's list, there were a number of things, you know, and Anne, correct me if I'm wrong, but that didn't even have allocations put towards them, but were already recognized projects with the 3.6. And so, you know, and and I get I I would. You know, again, you know, please clarify, but I think the 3.6 on your spreadsheet, you still had a small list of, of projects that would be uh, serious investments of capital that you weren't even including. And that's prior to my my coming and my identifying. Uh, that's correct. Um, but again, um, you know, definitely the 3.6 will be used, but there will be some prioritization involved uh, in, in all of this. So um, we may recognize that some things that the principal see may come before some other issues that, that are on that list. For example, the weatherproofing. So. Well, in that case, then I'd be inclined to uh, go closer to the number Dave suggested to make sure that we are covered and to make sure that that at the very least, we're hitting all of the uh, safety related and um, you know, maintenance with a capital M items. In other words, things that, that, we'll, that we can do that will preserve the investment we've made, not just something, okay, the, car, the carpet's uh, scuffed up and we could, we could use more carpet, but safety issues and structural issues, not, not um, cosmetic issues. So that, based on what I'm hearing now and, and the list that we've seen, I'd be inclined to, uh, to move closer to the number Dave suggested. So I'd, I'd like to bring this in for a landing tonight because I don't think we should try and decide. I think we should probably take this to a full board discussion at July and explain where our positions are. Um, Mike, do you want to add any closing thoughts? You're on mute. You're, you're muted, Mike. I was going to take a look at the KCBA stuff. I mean, you know, taking advantage of situations right now. I mean, you read the, read the journal, read CNBC. I mean, you know, in, in, in taking money versus a, you know, a public school system. So if we were thinking more like a business, we'd be taking as much debt as we could at 1% right now. Again, not suggesting that. I'd like to look at that. Mike, we're, we have a little bit of a giggle because your sound is, is, is going very stretched periodically. So I think we got a small window of what you were saying about taking on debt. I don't know if it would help if you turned off your video so that we could um, hear you clearly. All right, I think my video, is my video off now? That's better, Mike. Is my, I think my video is off now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And we the, the rest of the world is telling us that we should be acting like a business. For-profit businesses are taking advantage of what's going on in the markets right now. Uh, they're taking on debt left and right because it's cheap and they're investing in projects that are priority for them or are things that will cost the less money to do now than in the future. I'm not suggesting that. I personally would like to look at the KCBA stuff again. I would really like the administration to take a look at that and see if the priorities that we made a year and a half ago are still the priorities that we should have now. Um, and then maybe we can lock in a number with the larger board. I think that we've had a good discussion here, but we have five other board members that we have to engage. 
So if I can go about making a proposal for what we want to do for July, um, could we have the 3.6 million uh, new money as a presentation on the for illustrative purposes only format? One for 4.6 million. And then would it be possible, and this is where you can tell me if this is, this is gonna work or not, would it be possible for the administration to come up with a number which would be the maximum that bond council would, per, would view favorably at where we are in the situation right now? Um, do, do you understand what I'm asking with that? I think I do, Anne. Um, in terms of, do we have solid project estimates that can be done to in go three to years? let's say five point six or something like that? Yeah, what what would that ceiling be for right now? Right, and the other question is um, the three point six million kind of was the break even savings versus new debt service. So you're asking to go beyond that, where there's an adding to debt service. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that it's important for the board to weigh in on here because it doesn't sound like there is a consensus right now that exists and just giving us additional time to look at it um, and to bring in other voices is going to be able to break that uh, break that opinion. But this is exciting because this is exactly what board should be doing these big strategic questions. So this is a good thing. Um, but I think that it would be good to have what that ceiling would be because then the argument really becomes you know we we know that we can do 3.6 and then there's other board members who are saying let's go you know let's go as high as we can because we're still not elongating our uh, our debt service out past that 29 period um you know i don't agree with that but i think having the discussion with all the heads around the table will be most beneficial. And, and that way we can really find a consensus about how to move forward. Okay, I'll do my best to put something together. Um, you know, the, the transportation center is the wild card and the administration building. So, uh, and I'll ask Peter Edelman, hey, we think we're gonna do it, but we're not sure, well then, well, and, it, and if bond council comes back and says like, hey, we don't think you should do this anywhere past 4 million, then that's very clarifying for us. Then we don't have to worry about discussing 4.6. Um, so that way, you know, we, we create the contours of the discussion within the math that's going to work. Okay. Marvelous. And then um, could you send us, resend us the KCBA study schedule um, and then because I know that there's a lot on your guys's plate so I think you know one of the things that we can do is maybe raise questions as we see them um, that that would be my preference unless Mike you object to to kind of go in that route for July um, you you can weigh in here um, but I think that that might be the best way to be productive with that time yeah I agree with that okay all right, um, then we have our game plan. Uh, I met with uh, Ann and Kim, um, and there will be a schedule slash uh, plan in broad contours for the rest of the fall that we're gonna be working on. And I'm gonna try and get out here as soon as possible. My, my mind's kind of been focused on some other projects that we have here as well as at work. Uh, so I've been a little bit slow about that, but I'm, I'm committed to getting that out. Uh, and then, um, Ann and Kim, were you able to touch base with John? Yes, uh, uh, John and I had a conversation uh, this weekend about the fact that a lot of um, what's going to be happening with our budget and planning is going to be around facilities. Um, as head of the uh, facilities committee, I, John, and as new superintendent, it's always helpful for me to do that. John and I are going to take a tour of the facilities uh, with some building principles. I saw my to-do list to set that up um, so that he can uh, you know, get a firsthand uh, look at the kind of thing that building principles are talking about. And then ultimately, you know, bring that back to uh, perhaps what is a joint facilities slash business functions committee meeting to talk about 
the specifics of prioritizing those needs and you know the cost parameters around all of them. Okay. And John, so I'm John back to that. John, if I if I can, then what I'd like to do, if you're okay with it, is to um, do that draft schedule that I alluded to, and then I'll email that to you, and then we can try and hammer out what you're comfortable with and moving forward for the fall. Great, thank you. Okay, sweet. All right, uh, with that, I think we can call it an evening, and I shall see y'all sooner than you care to see me. I'm sure. So, <laughs> have a great night, everybody. Thanks, Hunter. Have a good evening. Take care, everyone. Everybody.